All right, here we are another night where there's nowhere to go, nothing to do, and no one to look up to. All the great podcast themes have been turned into podcast theme parks, and I don't know about you, but... Hello, baby, I've been waiting for a Christian Slater podcast. I'm Oswald Ramirez, and I'm back with the greatest co-host on Earth. Uh, Reno Carson, and I'm back, much to the chagrin of the haters and losers. (laughs) I speak of with great love and affection because they can't help that they were born fucked up. (laughs) I wondered if you were going to mention that, and I'm glad you did. It was pretty funny. I, I left all those comments, by the way. That was me. <laughs> we were going to talk about Heathers, but we're not. We're going to talk about 2012's masterpiece, Bullet to the Head, which uh, came out and left in 2012. But before that, some old business. This is kind of a return, in a way, to our, like, our beginnings with... Uh, what's the movie we watched in the beginning with the vampires? Uh, yeah. Interview... Yes, because we're back in New Orleans, but also recently my parents made me watch The Equalizer, which you brought up and said was in a Lowe's, and I thought you were joking and being clever about movies shot in front of green screens as looking like they're shot in like a hardware store, but no, that movie literally takes place in a Lowe's. I didn't know that. No, yeah, I mean, every movie looks like it's shot in a Lowe's, but that movie is literally shot in a Lowe's. (laughs) And then when we were talking about The Contender, you were talking talking about how Joan Allen seems like she should be like a Republican uptight wife and we forgot she was Pat Nixon in the movie Nixon. That's perfect for her. And that William Peterson was not only the river man in The Contender, he was also Pat Garrett in Young Guns too. Oh yeah, and remember how we were talking about people with mystery operations when they were young and I was saying that I just started this Oliver Stone book and he was saying that he, he had an operation and didn't know what it was. Well, when you get further along in it, it turns out that he tells you what it was and it was that he was having a testicle removed and his parents lied to him i don't remember talking about this are you sure that we talked about this i thought we did i don't remember talking about secret operations yeah when people are children yeah and i was thinking that maybe he mistrusts the system because his parents lied to him about that operation that's true that's pretty fucked up And in the episode with Hunter, where we talked about the movie The Wizard, Mm -hmm. I pointed out that the movie had a lot of Native Americans riding in the back of truck beds places. And turns out that's still legal on a lot of reservations. So that wasn't just a crazy thing in the movie. I think that was all my old business. Yeah, I think Fred Savage, um, who Hunter is obsessed with, he got canceled this week. He did, yeah, he did. He's in trouble. Yeah, so that's new news. For inappropriate behavior, on the, he got fired from the Wonder Years. Yeah. Do you know what he did at all? Has anybody said? I don't know. I don't know, like, what kind of bad behavior it was. I don't know if he's just, like, a tyrant or an asshole or something, or if it was, like, Me Too kind of stuff. I don't know. It's kind of shocked that this is still, like, shocking that this is, like, still happening. <laughs> it just happened to Frank Langella on a show. He got fired off of a show, like, a couple weeks ago. Similar thing where nobody will say i mean it's like you kind of think like you would think that people would like temper their behavior or something but good good for them that they don't well we don't know what he did (laughs) 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 yeah i might really regret um saying that so depending on what he did (laughs) we're talking about bullet to the head which i had never seen had you ever seen bullet to the head definitely not no had you even heard i didn't even know it existed yeah Uh, i remember it as one thing like it's like when it came out it was think it was the first movie anybody that was in game of thrones had done after Game of Thrones got popular. It was like the first one that came out and I just remember reading reviews and I hadn't seen Game of Thrones and people were talking about how Jason Momoa was in a movie like in these reviews and that was the main thrust of the reviews is Jason Momoa from Game of Thrones seems promising in this unpromising movie. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I wanted to ask you, you, you said that uh, women don't really like The Rock. How do you feel about Jason Momoa? Jason Momoa, like, obviously kind of has, like, a better face than The Rock to start out with, I think. But, like, he's also just simply too large. <laughs> My dad says he has a weird Cro-Magnon thing like dudes get when they do steroids. Yeah, it's just too much. It, like, distorts 
how you look or something. Like, I feel like I've seen pictures of him before he looked all crazy like that. It's like he already is starting to look kind of crazy in this movie, which this movie was in 2012, right? Yes. It's like theoretically he's a good looking guy, but yeah, he just looks something is like off. What about how crazily ripped Sylvester Stallone is in this movie for like a it's guy so who's like crazy like it's crazy it's like yeah it's not <laughs> he's in like he's got like zero percent body fat in this movie and he's like 65 or something and it maybe even older he's like a hundred years old nipples protruding like looking like i was like disturbed honestly <laughs> i think i was just like once again this is elder abuse especially after hearing all this shit about bruce willis that came out i was like this is exactly that kind of movie <laughs> I don't know, I've seen um, Sylvester Stallone in public after this movie came out, like years after, and he certainly didn't seem addled at all. He seemed pretty regular. I mean, he might be regular, but like, they shouldn't be making him do this. Like, he shouldn't have to do like, bullet to the head. Can he just live a normal life or do like, movies that are like, respectable? <laughs> like, bullet to the head is not respectable. <laughs> I think he was probably a large thrust behind it. I was looking into like, online things about this movie. It was based on a comic book, a friend French comic book and the hero in the French comic book looks kind of like Sylvester Stallone but I guess that it was supposed to star Thomas Jane and according to internet legend this may not be true that Thomas Jane brought in either Walter Hill or Sylvester Stallone or both and then Walter Hill decided that movies like this don't make a lot of money in America but overseas they do well so he decided to fire Thomas Jane and get Sung Kang who ends up being the second lead with Sylvester Stallone in this. That guy is actually really attractive. He's really hot, that guy. He's the guy, I guess, from Fast and the Furious movies. Yeah, which I, I've seen like the really early Fast and the Furious movies that came out when I was like a kid, but I haven't seen them, like I've the new ones. seen like the first on one like and the seventh years. one or something. <laughs> I love movies like that because as you know, I just love movies with like people exploding out of windows. And like, I actually do enjoy this kind of stuff, but you know, I just, I never have like an occasion to just be like, I'm gonna sit down and watch one of the Fast and the Furious movies. Please. They're kind of in that realm of too crazy for me or something. Like they're and they're always PG thirteen. Like I kind of I'm way more likely to watch something like Bullet to the Head, which the reason we're watching it is somehow now it's been so long I forgot how I came across it it existing but I didn't I remember the movie somewhat existing but no I didn't know Christian Slater was even in it and I just saw that he was in it and I was like let's watch this this is the kind of movie I watch like some violent rated R movie he's barely in this this is probably like gotta be one of the movies he's like least in right I mean except for maybe like interview with the vampire interview with the vampire yeah that we've seen so far yeah He's not in this one much. No. And this one has a weird like hierarchy of villains where the main villain in this movie is less famous than all of the other guys playing villains in the movie, which is rare, to me at least. Like, did you recognize the main villain in this at all? I don't even remember. Like, I'm having like a hard time even remembering. Like, I remember all the people at like the Eyes Wide Shut party and like, but He's, yeah, I'm having a hard time even it's remembering the black dude. villains. Oh, yeah, like where they're talking about tearing down public housing to like build. Condos. Yeah, his scheme is like one yeah. of the least fun, nefarious schemes. He wants to build condos. Yeah. But I can actually appreciate that because that is actually like truly evil and villainous. So he I is, could appreciate that. He is kind like, of more of a highline villain than the other guys. I guess we'll get into the plot. Begin spoilers. We start off with a bullet that goes through the opening production titles. I knew that this was going to be really, truly something, just seeing that. And then we get a trillion producers, including Joel Silver. Oh, I think it was Joel Silver's idea, actually, to fire Thomas Jane and get Sun Kang. And also, the original title was changed. It was going to be called Hedge shot but what's crazy is that thomas jane was involved when it was going to be called headshot and thomas jane already made a shitty movie called kill shot based on an elmore leonard novel from the director of shakespeare in love have you ever seen that movie not shakespeare in love but kill shot no it's really bad it's with thomas jane and mickey rourke all of these movies are so crazy and they all just seem like a front for like money laundering or something like not that would certainly do <laughs> 
It was like the most low energy movie ever made. Then there's a train, and I was wondering, is that a bullet train that starts the movie? But it probably wasn't. That Who goes knows? by. Then we see, I guess it starts off with Sun Kang getting into a car, and then the, whoever's driving the car puts a gun to his head. And then that driver gets shot by Sylvester Stallone, who's outside his window. And then Stallone narrates and explains that he just saved a cop's life, which normally isn't his style. And then we see all of his Baton Rouge, we see his Baton Rouge, Rouge, Louisiana mugshot, Sylvester Stallone's. Does it ever explain, like, what Sylvester Stallone's, like, backstory is in this movie? Because you kind of, like, get a little bit of backstory about, like, some of the other characters, but I don't remember if, was he ever really a cop, Sylvester Stallone, or he's not? No, he was in the Navy, and he got in trouble in the Navy. Oh, I remember. Yeah, he's like a hitman with a heart of gold, and at some point they explain, like, he's been arrested 16 or 32 times or something and convicted like four times but every time all of his convictions are some kind of like he was really the hero and it's a lie it's very yeah. crazy i remember now them saying that like he got like dishonorably discharged from the military or something for some weird i don't remember something like was, stealing like. explosives or something and then he explains yes. to the cop he's like what they don't write in there is that i'm really a god and this was just another <laughs> guy's fault but then this is i think where they show us all the like montage of Sylvester Stallone mug shots over the years that are pictures of him from other movies. I thought that was kind of fun. Yeah, I don't even remember that part either. Yeah, it was like him in guessing Fist or Rocky or just there was just different Stallones over the years and you could see his neck just getting or his head growing <laughs> into his neck and his neck just getting bigger. Oh yeah, another thing I noticed about when this was like in the Baton Rouge, Louisiana mug shot, that was my first clue that this was made during that Louisiana tax shelter for movies where the movies got tax breaks for shooting in Louisiana and all the movies took place in Louisiana. And then we go and it's like nighttime and flashing back to before he, this all this happened. Not the mug shots, but before he killed the guy in the car and saved the cop. We find out his name's Lewis. No, his partner's name's Lewis. He's a hitman partner's with John Seda, who yeah, rides shotgun. Yeah, the husband in Selena. Ah, uh, I've never the, seen Selena. I remember Selena. him from The Matrix. Yeah, I remember him as the husband in Selena. Isn't Sylvester Stallone's name in this movie like Bobo or something? Yes, his name's Bobo. That's right, not Lewis. Though some people call him Louie as the movie goes on, and some people call him Lewis. It gets crazy. And then they, when they're driving, they're driving to go do a hit or something. They're in suits, and they almost hit this cat and the cat in the road like it's like eyes flash all crazy and it was pretty trippy John Seda tells Stallone he hate that he's like you hate cats and he's like I don't hate cats I hate dander or something like that I was like that's kind of funny I don't like it they have a nice modern car and they've got digital GPS etc and then later on like Stallone has like no idea how how smartphones work but he can work all the shit in his car fine and then they banter and we get the some Nolans blue score. Walter Hill, who made this, he's made a lot of movies with bluesy scores like this. Yeah, the music in this is, like, very aggressive. And he started with Long Riders with Ry Cooter, and then he did multiple ones with Ry Cooter. Some guy named Steve Mazzaro does this one. I don't know if he's from a band or anything. Have you ever seen, um, Long Riders. Mm -mm. It's a Western about the James and the Younger Gang, like the Jesse and Frank James Gang. But it has the Jesse and Frank James, then it has the Younger Brothers, which which there are three, and it has the Miller Brothers, and then it has uh, the coward Robert Ford and his brother who shoots Jesse James, and they're all played by real brothers. It's pretty crazy. It's like James and Stacy Keach play Jesse and Frank James, then the Carradine Brothers play the Youngers, and then uh, Dennis and Randy Quaid play the Millers and um, Christopher Guest and his brother Bob play Robert Ford and his brother something. That sounds really weird. Is it like funny or serious? No, it's serious. <laughs> it's like a ser- it's like this movie except for probably higher budget and was got a bigger release. It's a mixed bag. It has some cool parts. James Remar's in it. He gets in a knife fight with David Carradine. Who's James Remar? He's the guy that one time you told me what my picture of someone sleazy was, and I said James Remar, and... Oh, I think I remember talking about this, and then I googled him. Like, I think I remember us talking about this before. Yeah, he got fired from the main male role in Aliens for being too coked out. I had to replace him, and then you can even find pictures of him in the role, like, in 
in the movie before they replaced him and he's like just super skinny. I actually watched Alien last night, but oh, what the do first we one or the it? second one? The first one. Okay. He's he was supposed to be in the second one. Oh, you know, but. Walter Hill, who directed this movie, wrote the screenplay for the first alien and gets paid for all the different aliens. He rewrote it. On the Brett Easton Ellis uh, podcast, he talked about how like the original script for Alien, he said, sucked really badly, except for it had the face or the chest burster. And he was like, ooh, let's rewrite this. I'm trying to think of what movie I like recognize this guy from. Band of the Hand. Uh, what all movies is he in? He just He's in Pineapple Express and Django Unchained, but he's fairly unrecognizable as an older guy compared to when he was younger. He's the bad guy in 48 Hours. He's in The Warriors. I, I feel like the movie I'm thinking of, like he plays a creep in it or something. Probably. He usually plays a creep. Like, is it a show? Is it a movie? Like, what is it from? I'm going through his, like... Oh my gosh, no, it's Sex and the City again. That's where I recognize him from. He's Richard Wright on Sex and the City. Ah, was he sleazy yeah. on it? He's, like, sleazy, but not... I don't know. He's, like, just, like, a rich philanderer, kind of. Not, like, creepy sleazy. He's in a lot of the Walter Hill movies, really. I'm almost surprised he's not in this movie somewhere, because Walter Hill puts him in... And he used to put him in everything. So Walter Hill did 48 Hours and Long Riders and The Warriors. Walter Hill did a movie called Hard Times that is, like, uncredited ripoff of a Louis L'Amour boxing story. Walter Hill did Red Heat with Arnold Schwarzenegger and Jim Belushi. He had a big run as a big action director then really faded away with uh, I guess some flops like Red Heat maybe was a flop I'm not sure but then he did like Last Man Standing with Bruce Willis which is a remake of Yo Jimbo. He did that crazy movie Crossroads where Ralph Macchio sells his soul to the devil for blues guitar style skills and then in recent years he did a TV miniseries called The Broken Trail that was pretty good but I think his most recent movie if I'm not mistaken is called The Assignment and it's a movie where Michelle Rodriguez plays a dude that gets kid that's like an evil like gangster hitman dude that gets kidnapped by a mad scientist played by Sigourney Weaver and gets changed into a chick and then goes for revenge and it's like a hard R crazy low budget action <laughs> movie it's very crazy that sounds kind of good I enjoyed it maybe more than this movie yeah I this movie this movie's and it's entertaining enough. Yeah. It, it, to me, like, we'll get to it, but I was kind of in on this movie for a long time ex and thought it was fun. And then at some point, just all the energy went out for, for, it, for in it for me. It was pretty much exactly when Christian Slater dies. Like, after that, yeah. like, I was just like, the rest of this movie is just, I don't care at all. And then Louis, they, they uh, what's his face? Bobo asks Lewis if he's ready. And Lewis is like, Lewis is ready. And then they pull up outside a ho fancy hotel and it pans up and there's like neon above the sign that's this like the sign of the hotel just says bullet to the head and i kind of felt like this is the kind of movie where the two and bullet to the head should be a two instead of the name definitely. word it definitely should be yeah this is definitely that kind of movie and i also wish norland's legend master p was in the movie somewhere this movie would be so much better if master p was in it. yeah like he could have been lewis or this he could have been better if like a lot of other people were in it or something it's like yeah that's a problem like although the asian actor is hot but like really brings nothing to the table here yeah I, I didn't really have a problem with him in fact i was gonna say like some of this cast in this movie we'll get to pretty much now this has secretly like not just christian slater but other actors i really like in it and the first one is the guy they show up to kill in this scene Holt McElhaney I think is the guy's name or is it oh yeah. yeah I wish that the whole movie kind of had like more of that vibe I feel like that scene is a little bit more like it's like you see the bullet in the beginning and all the credits and stuff and then you see that scene of just like this crazy man with like a gratuitous like nudity shower titty scene yes it was great yeah this is what I was in like, on the shit, movie tons of coke and you're like okay this is gonna be like something yeah he's but just in sure boxer brief Briefs and doing promise. blow and drinking whiskey. One thing though, for what he was doing, didn't you think he should have had like some kind of tattoos? He had no tattoos. I thought that was kind of a miss. I mean, it's totally unclear like who that guy is or really.
really like anything about him. It's like in these movies, it's all just kind of nothing is really explained to you. Just that like this is a movie about people who are really good at murdering. They do explain who that guy is eventually, though. He's a dirty cop that I guess had files on the main bad guy because that's what the the uh, Korean cop from wherever he's from, I forget, Washington, D.C. or something, shows up to like find out what happened to him. And that's yeah. kind of what sets the plot in motion to or at least the cops plot plot in motion because what happens here is yeah they kill this guy they shoot him in this hotel room but they let the hooker live and we see she has like a crazy puma or something panther tattooed on her back which is kind of the reverse of very bad things where they just kill the hooker and they let yeah the, i was like disturbed the coked out the, guy live it's weird how like i have such less when i was i watched this documentary recently about john wayne gacy or something and it's like i've heard all of this stuff about serial killers and stuff my whole life and never really felt affected by it just because it's like it's so like horrible and stuff that it's like incomprehensible or in movies i've never really been super affected by gratuitous violence or anything but like i don't know as i get older i don't really have like a stomach for it or something so when they were just like i thought they randomly like killed the hooker or something i was like I don't know. I don't have like the stomach for this kind of stuff. And I was really relieved that he didn't kill her. <laughs> Sometimes in movies, you just don't want to see some people get tortured or beat up or killed. It's just something like sometimes you're into it and sometimes you're not, as well, or at least for me. And here, I can deal with it when it's funny or something like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood or like when it's really over the top and funny and crazy. Like it's just like when things are like hyper realistic or just like, I don't know, I have a much harder time like watching that kind of stuff as I get older. It was pretty unrealistic and very bad things, but still, it just maybe it was that they wanted it to be so funny and it just wasn't. Yeah. yeah. I don't know what was going on in very bad things and like why it was so like jarring and disturbing, but it definitely is. What about Holt McElhaney? Did you recognize that guy? He's been the in everything lately. Guy? Yeah. I don't know. Let me Google him again. Do you watch Mindhunter or did you? I wa- did. I did watch Mindhunter. He's Hunter, the FBI yeah. guy. He's also. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And he's in Michael Mann's Black Hat and Fight Club. I think Club. I didn't recognize him as the guy from Mindhunter because, like, he's. Yeah, he kind of looks different in this movie. He's put on weight. Yeah, he's like heavier and he looks a little different. I just saw him in a shockingly entertaining movie from 2021 called Wrath of Man. Have you seen? It's the newest Guy Ritchie movie and it stars Jason Statham. And I thought it was going to stink. And I was like, hmm wasn't perfect but it was pretty damned entertaining i thought no i have not seen it it's just it's an r-rated action movie it's tons of violence and has scott eastwood and what's this it's josh hartnett shows up in it oh interesting i haven't seen him in forever i like josh hartnett yeah lewis and bobo they go to a crazy raucous bar in the crescent city and they booze it up and there's a cajun band this movie kind of has all the new orleans music that they didn't have any of in interview with the vampire this is where we first see Jason Momoa and he's got like a knife. People are drinking beer out of plastic cups at this bar right like silo cups I can only assume Sylvester Stallone's listed height is 5'10 so I can only assume that he is like 5'8 max (laughs) and when he's standing next to or fighting Jason Momoa like that looks very crazy. Like I'm even surprised that they would choose him because they look so crazy fighting each other. Yeah, it's kind of weird that Sylvester Stallone's the action hero, but Frank Stallone's the tall one. Yeah, so then like Jason Momoa, he goes and he kills Lewis for referring to himself in third person. Also, if you ever go to a bar that has those like just plastic silo cups and drinks for drink out of them, I would trust that more than the crazy three compartment sink washing system that bartenders have at most bars where it's like they just dunk in a thing and swish it around a couple of times on a brush and throw it in this other thing. They're like, here you go. Put your mouth on this, buddy. I pretty much... That experience is just like drinking out of like a gross, dirty cup that like a bunch of other people drink out of. Yeah, my rule of thumb at restaurants is anytime you can get her a straw to go for that. That said, if I'm having like scotch or a beer or something, I don't get a straw. I just drink out of the glass. So let's just alone goes to the bathroom and then he sees in a pretty cool rack focus shot, he sees Momoa coming into the bathroom behind him to kill him and then they get in a fight and Stallone gets away and then Momoa runs away I guess and this is where we find out that 
Stallone's character was arrested 26 times. And then he, he grew into the neck by the fourth mugshot. We get a plane touching down at Louis Armstrong International Airport, which has been renamed due to Louis Armstrong's racist views. No, I made that up. That's not true. He's Detective Sun Kang is the... Uh, character. I guess, is that the actor or the character? I don't know I this guy's name. Actor. No, I think it's the character. I think his real name is Taylor Kwan. Okay. Unless that's the, wait, let's look this, I'll look this up. I think it's up. the opposite. I think, I don't know. You're I think right. It's no, I'm. The, you're right. His the actor's name is Sun Kang, and the character's name is Taylor Kwan. You I only him. know this because I remember like someone coming out and being like Sun Kang when the credits were rolling, and they're like, "What a cool name!" <laughs> so that's kind of why I remember it. I, Who like, was it that came out? Um, it was my mom that came out. Nice. Um, but I was I was thinking about this guy because I was thinking about this time when I was younger. I was like hanging out with some friends, and there was this guy who was gonna come and like meet us at a bar. And my friend referred to him as tall and aging. <laughs> and um, like my me. friend kept thinking that like this guy was saying tall and Asian. So she was like, oh, tall and Asian. Like that sounds really attractive or something. And that's kind of like in my mind, she was thinking of a guy who looks like Sun King or something, like some hot, tall Asian guy. But it was actually this guy who's like 29, but looked 40. So that's why my friend referred to him as um, aging. <laughs> and he like spun out of control on paternity leave. <laughs> and, like, Whoa. Became a coke head. <laughs> And everyone would like invite him everywhere because he like always had coke. And I remember like going to his house and like seeing it, like it was all dirty and crazy, like with some like dilapidated crib and stuff. And it was kind of sad. <laughs> But anyway. How many years ago is this now? This is probably like 10 years ago. So I wonder if that kid is still alive or has been taken by the state or if the parents are still together or what? Well, the mom like left the dad who spun out of control on paternity leave. So the kid is probably fine. Okay, good. Yeah. I guess. <laughs> so Sun, Detective Sun Kang, he, he, I'm not sure who he works for. I think they maybe don't say he's a Fed or he says he's not a Fed or something, but he goes to a police station in New Orleans and he talks to a guy who I really didn't recognize, but who apparently must be a New Orleans actor because he's like in a bunch of movies that take place in New Orleans. And then the hooker that they left live earlier is in there giving her a statement. Sun Kang sees the panther tat on her back. And then he goes by the coroner's office and John Seda's corpse is in there. Taylor Kwan, he thinks the two murders might be related. Then he finds out that Seda's character is a known associate of G Jimmy Bobo, who is played by Stallone. And Taylor Kang wants to find Stallone now, of course, and so, but they make him give over his gun because he doesn't have a Crescent City carry per permit. And they call Sylvester Stallone's phone a bunch and leaves a message. We, this is where we go back to Stallone, who's mad about getting set up because he thinks that the guys... That I think they were supposed to get paid at that bar or something, and instead they got Jason Momoa, and he's now pissed and wants to find out what happened. And so he agrees to meet Sun Kang at a bar. And this is the part where he orders the bullet bourbon. Do you oh, remember yeah. this? Yeah, and he's like, you should have brought your own bottle or something. Yeah, and they just keep bringing up bullet bourbon in this movie like it f helped fund the movie for sure. <laughs> Like it was like what so is that a real thing? Yeah, that's a real brand. It's I kind of a popular was, brand. I just assumed it was like a fake thing because this movie is called Bullet no, for that. And it's it's spelled differently. It's spelled like B U L L E I T, like bullet or something like that. I'm not sure. Maybe it has two T's at the end, I can't remember. But yeah, bullet bourbon is a real thing. My buddy Philbert likes to drink it. And yeah, I'm pretty sure they probably paid for a lot of this movie. It's from some pretty egregious product placement. Probably like three times in this movie. We hear them ask about bullet bourbon at least. Taylor Kwan meets him at the bar and he says Greeley, that was the whole McElhaney character, was an ex-DC cop. So I guess Kwan is a DC cop and Kwan is on his case. He suggests they work together to get to the bottom of what happened that Greeley was involved in. And then we see there's like a parade. New Orleans has the only street parades that look fun to me on earth. Other than, like, everywhere else they look lame, but in New Orleans they look really cool. Quan's at the parade, and he gets chased by some guys into a parking garage, and they have guns, and he doesn't. And he beats a dude up, and then shoots the guy with his own gun, and then finds out the guy has a badge. And then Quan gets shot by the other guy in the arm, and then Stallone runs the guy over with his Cadillac, and that was pretty cool, where he, where he hits the guy with his car. And then earlier he had a Dodge, and now he has a Cadillac, and I was thinking that it was, like, probably smart of him not to use his regular car to hit 
visit that guy and mess his car up. And then Quan gets in the car with Stallone, and they put guns to each other's heads, and they decide that they'll hang out or something instead of fighting. Yeah. And this is where we meet Christian Slater, who is meeting with Jason Momoa, and the big villain in the movie, who is Adewale Akinoye Agbaje, I believe is that guy's name. And Christian Slater explains the whole movie to us that Greeley was a cop, and he sent his evidence file to a guy named Happy Jack as an insurance policy on his life that didn't work. And it lays out that Agbaje paid off a congressman to get a government contract that they have They have an informant who knows where the file is and they want Amoa to go destroy the file. So he has to go see Happy Jack. And this is and then we cut to a bunch of tattoo templates. Thank God I don't have any of these tattoos on my skin. And we see the sexy tattoo artist. It's called Tattoo Baba is the place, the name of the place. Which is funny because we find out that we, we're, I think we're meant to believe that this is um, Stallone's girlfriend. But her name, I guess, is Baba and his is Bobo. Yeah. And she's finishing some, like, tattoo on a lady and gives her advice. Bobo and Quan pull up outside and Stallone, he puts his pistol in his glove compartment and then he gets mad at Quan for something and says they're going to do this his way to fix the guy's bullet wound and they go he goes into the Stallone goes into the tattoo parlor and leaves Quan in the car and Quan takes the firing pin out of Bobo's pistol and Quan and Bobo tells the tattoo lady that he needs to talk to her this is where she says she gets lonely and it's been a while since they talk and he says he has a friend who gets shot got shot and she need, and needs help he says it's the last time he'll ask her to operate on a shot guy he swears which is kind of funny did you recognize this lady from anything I didn't I don't think so so then Quan calls the New Orleans cop guy and gives him an update on on their investigation and Stallone brings the girl out to see him and she says he doesn't look like a low life and Stallone says that yeah he's a cop and she says okay I'll help him and then she operates on him and it's like hurting him and Stallone's like laughing when it hurts him that's that's kind of funny and Quan sees that she has a mat tat that matches the hooker's tat and she has him drink bullet bourbon while she operates so we brought that back oh yeah then there's a part where, like she she's doing the operation where you see like his chunks of skin getting put into that little petri dish or plate thing when she's removing them did that bother you i know you're a little squeamish no i've like gotten so much less squeamish like over the last year just because i had to confront my like squeamishness about all this stuff i used to not be able to get like shots or do anything or get blood drawn and yeah i i'm a lot less squeamish than i was even one year ago <laughs> I thought those skin things were kind of a nice touch that were in the, the plate. I was like, I don't remember seeing that in another movie. Quan tells her he's going to arrest Bobo, and she gets kind of mildly indignant. And Stallone says, give him a band-aid and a blow pop so they can get out of there. I was thinking it should be called bullet to the head with the uh, bullet spelled like the bullet bourbon, which I guess it doesn't have an E. It has two T's. That's the thing. And it's no E in the last part. It's B-U-L-L-I-T-T. Okay. Like bull. It, it. Yeah, it's our most outrageous product placement movie since The Wizard. This movie also made me want to go to New Orleans. Are you a New Orleans fan? I have only been to New Orleans like as a kid, and I remember it just being kind of scary. But <laughs> I'm sure that as an adult, it would be cool and fun, and I would like to go as an adult. I went as an underage teenager and didn't drink or party or anything, but I thought it looked really cool and just would like to go back. So Momoa goes into the club looking for Baby Jack. His name isn't Happy Jack, it's Baby Jack. And then there's this backroom poker game and he goes and he kills all these bodyguards then makes Baby Jack open a safe for him. Momoa puts a title in him. Then he goes out and he kills the bartender and he kills everyone in the bar. The movie's not violent enough. And Momoa gets in a white limo with the bad guy, Bajé, and he gives the bad guy the file from the safe. And the bad guy's really happy with Momoa's work. And then Stallone gives Quan pain pills and tells him it's the extract of white tiger juice to put lead in his pencil, which is our first uh, Asian joke. Sylvester Stallone just looks so, like, weird in this movie. And I'm like, has he gotten more or less weird looking in the last 10 years? What do you think the answer is? Let me see what he looks like in 2022. Is this movie newer or older than The Expendables? Good question. I'm going to say older, but I definitely don't know that for yeah. Not sure either. The first movie. Oh, it came out in 2010. Oh, okay, so this is after the Expendables. A little bit newer. Okay. But yeah, like I don't know. Like he looks so like weird in this movie. He's like crazily, crazily ripped. 
and huge. Yeah, his body is crazy, and it's really jarring to see that on, like, someone his age or something. Recently, I watched all of the Rambo movies, and it's crazy just to watch him transform throughout the Rambo movies from the first one where he's, like, he's buff, like, really buff, but he's, like, looks like a normal human, and he looks skinny, and then he just gets, like, more and more roided out or something, or just huger and huger, not to cast aspersions. He just, like, gets, like, crazily, crazy looking. Even by the second one, he looks crazy, but he gets progressively more crazy. I'm looking at pictures of him. What? This is like, excuse is this like recent? He looks like he gained, he's actually like fat now, which kind of mm. makes me happy. Yeah, like. it does make me happy. <laughs> yeah, I feel like in the most recent Rambo, he's like got the huge arms, but he's kind of fatter. Yeah. yeah, like he has like kind of a, he just has like an old man gut or something and he's like smoking a cigar, which is what he should be doing. He yes. shouldn't be like mainlining human growth hormone <laughs> and like. He's more living the Arnold Schwarzenegger lifestyle. Yeah, I'm like, I'm glad to see that he's just like living as an old man and like just getting fat and smoking cigars. Like, Especially with as much money as he must have. Yeah, like he should not it's like be like he doesn't need here. bullet to the head. He doesn't. He doesn't. That's what's so like weird. I just always think, yeah, like this has to be like a front for money laundering or some weird thing where it's like a favor to someone or like, because why? Like, did it, it can't just be that he read the script and was like, this is we so good. We must do this. <laughs> And he makes fun of Sung Kang here, not just with the tiger extract for boner pills. He also makes fun of him for being Asian and saying that he can't drive because he's Asian. But isn't Sung Kang from the Fast and the Furious movies like the most uh, can drive Asian we've seen in the movies, maybe? Yeah, probably. And then is this, or is it later, like he makes another joke about him being like a samurai or something? Oh, yeah, I think he does, and that's when he's like, I don't know if that's this part where later where he's like, that's the Japanese, I'm Korean. That's like me telling you uh, the best spaghetti's a taco or something like that. And he's like, yeah. that's a terrible analogy. <laughs> Which yeah, was actually pretty bad. good. <laughs> I think both are pretty, pretty bad. <laughs> Yeah, he plays a guy in those Fast and the Furious movies named Han, and he's from Seoul, and so people like say he's like Han Solo, but he first played Han in a movie I actually did see called Better Luck Tomorrow. So he's just constantly playing someone named Han? Yeah. Is that like a popular Korean name or something? And now he's going to be in that new Obi-Wan Kenobi show with Ewan McGregor, and the character Obi-Wan Kenobi met the character Han Solo. Is your mind blown, Reyno? I also have never seen Star Wars. I don't know anything about Whoa, Star Wars. Whoa, you've never seen Star Wars? Like no. any of the 12 or so mo Star Wars movies? I think actually I've seen like the Jar Jar Binks. Nice. <laughs> and that's the only one that I've seen. <laughs> and I just want to keep it that way. Jar Jar Binks is the best character they have. Yeah, it was so good that I didn't want to ruin it by watching the original film. Yeah, you've, you're, you've made a wise decision. So Kang, he thinks that uh, Taylor Kwan, he thinks that that girl, B Baba, was Stallone's lady, and Stallone lets him know it's his daughter. Then he asks how Kwan Kang made detective, if he can't even figure that out. And he says that Stallone then tells him that he was given the job of that of killing Greeley by a jerk named Ronnie Earl. And then Quan places a call on his smartphone to try to locate uh, Ronnie Earl. And then they're going to go to Ronnie Earl and try to shake him down for info or Stallone wants to take him out. They pull up all this information on him and I got excited immediately. Once again, like when I saw Holt McElhaney, I was like, I love this guy. The guy that plays Ronnie Earl is another guy I love. He plays a guy named Bucci on a show called John from Cincinnati that was like a failed HBO show. Have you ever heard of this? It's like a show about a family of surfers that's all messed up. And it's like they're like multiple generations of pro surfer and he's like the middle generation. He's like all heroin addicted. And it's like a David Milch show who specializes in characters that when you see them, you're like, this is going to be the most annoying, boring character ever. And then like by episode three, you're like, I love this guy. And he was like the a classic one of those. So it's like a serious show too. Yeah. It's like a, an alien or like a Jesus character just shows up on this beach in California and starts in at, performing miracles in the lives of this like family of surfers. This dysfunctional. That sounds really cool. <laughs> I really liked it. It's one season. It's weird. Ed O'Neill's in it, and Bruce Greenwood plays the dad, and Rebecca De Mornay plays the mom. Or I guess they're actually the grandparents. But then at some point, like there's like a pro surfing agent guy, or for like a surfwear company 
company that's going to like that they're trying to keep away from the grandson who's like an up and coming young surfer and it's Luke Perry is the agent guy that's all sleazy as the series progresses he starts finding a soul from hanging out with Jesus and then uh, they bring in an, an even sleazier guy from the same company to try to like steal Luke Perry's job and it's Mark Paul Gosseler Zach from Saved by the Bell so it's like Zach and Dylan from like, it's like they're there have this thing you're like dude this is pretty cool that sounds good now I want to find it it sounds cool well it has one crazy thing is that it's from the maker of Deadwood who I think was really pissed that they canceled Deadwood and he didn't get to wrap it up and so what I think is that he had a deal that like somehow he would get to wrap up the show and maybe like part way through season one or something they realized it was getting no ratings this is all conjecture by me just based on the last episode and the last episode of season one just goes crazy and tells you endings for all the characters and everything and they make no fucking sense like they're just based on footage that's shot for the final episode they just show a shot of two kids in this crowd and they're like these two characters went to outer space and came back as kids and stuff and you're it's like an ultimate kind of like it's kind of an f you to the network or to something or just to be able to do something with your show when you know you're not coming back for season two because it certainly seemed like in the last episode they were actually setting up a lot of uh stuff for season two but anyway i really enjoyed it brian van holt is the guy that played Bucci on John first from Cincinnati and he's cowboy Ronnie Earl though he doesn't dress like a cowboy and he was busted twice in Oklahoma City for illegal possession of firearms and now he's at a Turkish bathhouse called uh, the Maison Derriere Maison de Derriere no anyway, that's the one in um, The Simpsons and then the cops they cover the Momoa Billy Jack murder scene and they see the title and they uh, look at each other and then Stallone marvels at Quan's smartphone and he's like, you one of those phone guys? Oh yeah, it's so crazy that this is like before iPhones even. Like they're using like Blackberries or something. I'm yeah, I think this is like right in the early smartphone days, yeah. Which becomes a big part of the movie, the, the debating about smartphones and Quan gives this breakdown of ways he could kill Sylvester Stallone with his phone. <laughs> and it's so bad. And then Stallone's like, I could kill you with this apple slice. It's like because oh yeah, I forgot about that. I could distract you with it while I stab you with a knife. That was actually like probably like my favorite scene in this movie. It's like so weird and stupid. So he tells Quan to stay outside and he listen to the radio while he goes inside the bathhouse. And then we see that Bucci's getting a massage and Sylvester Stallone silently motions to the masseuse. Bucci doesn't see uh, Sylvester Stallone, but the masseuse lady does, and he's like he tells her to like moose sit over there and keep her mouth sh and then to like just sit here and keep your mouth shut forever forever he has all these tats so does Bucci oh wait Bucci didn't have tats either did he Ronnie he says Lewis was his boy and he hasn't he hasn't gotten paid for their job that went awry either and he didn't set them up and then he suggests that they hunt the the guy that said that hired him together and then he pulls out a gun but then Sylvester Stallone tells him guns don't kill people bullets do and he already unloaded Brian Van Holt's gun. He, you know, he also tells him he made a mistake by not checking the pistol's weight and by double crossing him. He made two mistakes. And so then Bucci, he tells him that the guy that hired him was Christian Slater, who plays a guy named Baptiste. And he tries to like offer Stallone all this money, but then decides to shoot him. And Or no, Stallone decides to shoot him, but Stallone didn't check his weight and didn't realize that his gun didn't have the firing pin. But I guess that's so light you wouldn't notice that you didn't have a firing pin, unlike bullets. Yeah, I don't know it, like enough about guns to know, but like... Yeah, I thought that that was also kind of a little bit hypocritical. Yeah, I did too. But then I asked my dad and I was like, would you notice if your firing pin was missing? He's like, no. But he's not like supposed to be like a, a professional right. murderer. You're either. right. That I know of. <laughs> and so then they would just wrestle around in their underpants for a long time. Is this your favorite part of the movie? Definitely not. And then when they fight and Stallone, he loads Bucci's gun and he shoots him and then ices him in a hot bath. And then they go, he goes outside and punches Taylor Kwan in the gut for taking out his firing pin. I just remembered something from the beginning of this movie that's really great that I forgot. <laughs> Where like the guy who's like doing cocaine in the beginning, like they shoot him and then he like comes back to life. Like he's that. like shot and you like assume that he's dead and then he like rises from the dead and like starts fighting people 
and stuff that was like a really good and like underrated scene that i forgot to mention a lot of the action like walter hill's a good action director and the fights in this movie are pretty good maybe up until the end where it's like mm, where they fight with the axes the end yeah i just kind of lost interest yeah i was, I was kind of out by then but i was getting mad because they killed off both hold McElhaney and brian van holt and it was clear that next they were going to go find christian slater you realize and then they're going to kill him off and i was like man this kind of sucks they should have reversed all this and had them kill the people in the opposite order so then they get files on christian slater and <laughs> they have the crazy fit pictures of christian slater and the different um websites and things and profile photos of him do you think they were real photos or somehow doctored i mean it couldn't be that hard to get real photos of him in suits and things but they looked crazy to me i don't i never remember like any scenes where people are like showing photos or like little details or something like i feel like i'm not like a good like detail person i'm kind of the opposite where it's like if in dvd and stuff files like if somebody's showing newspapers like i'll pause on the movie and try to look at the articles you're not supposed to be looking at in the newspaper to see what they say or like yeah. i went to an art museum last week called the philbrook in tulsa and they have this whole uh what do you call it, exhibit on these KKK killings of black people in Tulsa in 1921. And they have different newspapers from around the date of the killings and afterwards like blown up huge. And I found myself just reading all the other articles on the newspaper's front pages and stuff that were about different things, just being like, oh, look at what else was happening in 1921. And like in this movie, I was definitely looking at like, look at these, all these weird file photos. Oh, and I guess that the original director of this movie was going to be Wayne Kramer of the cooler fame. He fought with Stallone over what tone the movie should be. Yeah, I guess he wanted to make it a more serious movie because this movie is kind of very kind of light and over the top. It's definitely not Yeah, in part it's definitely four. not serious now. Wayne Kramer did make that movie with what's his face where Paul Walker runs around all crazy. What's that movie called? Do you remember that? Where it's like and it's very over the top. It's kind of fun. It's it's not terrible, but it's the kind of probably what kind of tone he wanted to go for for this. And they said this was the first major theatrical role for Christian Slater since Alone in the Dark, which Hunter and I will have covered by this episode that Alone in the Dark kind of killed his career. I was also thinking he was in the movie Slipstream, but maybe they don't count that as a major movie. And maybe this... it's called Running Scared the Yeah, book. that's the movie. Yeah, that could be worse. Good call. This was the worst Stallone box office performing movie in over 30 years. That does not surprise me at all. So it's from 2012. So with 30 years, I guess, like, what would be the movie that did that poorly? Was it like Stop or My Mom Will Shoot? or Oscar. I feel like I haven't seen a lot of Sylvester Stallone movies except well, the Rocky movies. No, this. it would have to go back even way farther. It would have to be like Rhinestone or something that did that poorly because Stop or My Mom Will Shoot would only be like 20 years old when Sylvester Stallone, when uh, Bullet to the Head came out. So it did worse than those. I, I remember it doing bad. That Sylvester Stallone is kind of like a fun actor though. Like I don't think he's like bad or like he's fun to watch and like even this movie, like he's not bad. He just couldn't carry it because the movie is bad. <laughs> I think that's pretty much the story of a lot of his movies, is that he's pretty decent. Like, we, I was watching Stop or My Mom Will Shoot with my buddy Dustin Jaker. Was, I was like, Sylvester Stallone's way better in this movie than this movie deserves, except for the fact that it's probably all Sylvester Stallone's idea to have this be a movie. So I don't know how to count that for or against Do you him. think they are his ideas? Like, do you think it's his idea to do this? Or, like, I don't know. I sort of wonder... I don't wonder think he you know. originated the idea of doing this as a movie but I certainly think he can pick and choose. I just, yeah, wonder, like, why he does shit like this. But Stop or My Mom Will Shoot, I think that was probably, to some degree, he was probably a prime mover behind getting funded. Because I he, don't know about that movie. What is that movie? Like, what's the That's deal? one where he's, like, about he's a cop sounds. that's, like, really on the edge, and his mom, who's an old lady played by Estelle Getty from the Wonder uh, Golden Girls, comes to stay with him for a while and turns his life upside down, and it's, like, a wacky comedy. Yeah, that's exactly what I was expecting yeah. from the title. Yeah, and that's like, I definitely think he had something to do with it, because I think he was like trying to compete with Arnold with movies like Kindergarten Cop that would just be massive hits. Yeah. And the Stallone comedies just never... I'm trying to think if any Stallone comedy ever really paid off. Tango and Cash is kind of a comedy. I don't know if that made money or not. It's a bad movie, but people liked it, some people. Oh yeah, this is where um, he says, it's like, bang, down, owned. 
I don't remember in what context. <laughs> we have more smartphone talk. Yeah, I'm trying to think of what the context of that was too, and I don't remember now. Either. He wasn't in the army, navy. He he wasn't in the navy. He was in the army, and he was accused of of stealing C4. But it turns out he he was innocent. But that wasn't reported. And this is where he calls him the samurai and says he's Korean and says his, he's like that's like saying my favorite Italian food is tacos. Do you think you could make that joke in 2022? See, that was one of the weird things about this movie is they didn't do an Asian joke for so long in the movie that I thought they weren't going to and I was like that's pretty cool that they didn't and then at <laughs> yeah. some point they do and they make a bunch and I, I was like oh it's weird I thought the same exact thing I had the same exact thought process because it's like there's nothing about him that seems foreign yeah exactly he just seems like an Asian American guy he just seems like he reminds me of like a surf row or yes. something yes yeah 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 he's about as like Korean as Keanu Reeves or something yeah, but then they start like Stallone's, you know, Stallone's an old man. It's like, I could definitely see, yeah, you know what? I definitely think they would do this the same way if like the Stallone character was played by Clint Eastwood or somebody. He would definitely yeah. get all weird and racial, but not yeah. if it was somebody younger. Then we get where it's like, they find out that Baptiste is having that party and it's going to be a dress up party. And they go and get costumes at the costume shop. And we have the montage of them trying on different costumes, like in every movie where people have to dress up for something. Thing. And they have to get new masks because it's an eyes wide shut party. And they really go for it. Yeah, they do. They I was really remember thinking like this them. movie's a th- I saw not just a throwback to when you could, would say a lot of racist stuff in a movie, but also a throwback <laughs> to when movies were good. It's true. Yeah. Because yeah, they go to this party and there's just tons of nudity. And then Jason Momoa is there, but he's wearing clothes and everybody's wearing masks. And the big bad guy is holding a meeting in an upstairs office. That's where we find out that he's going to build the condominiums. And Baptiste, later, he walks in on them and shakes hands with them. And then the bad guy tells him to get out for their meeting. And he has a cool, like, fox mask Slater does. Then we get, uh, he gets really, uh, the, he, they, they want more whiskey. And he asks a waitress for it. Then he passive-aggressively just steals one of their whiskeys, or all of their whiskeys, and drinks them and takes them to the bathroom. And then in the bathroom, he asks for drugs. Or he asks the lady to bring him drugs. Or, he, no, he goes in the bathroom and just asks asks if anybody's doing drugs in there, right? He's like, is anybody doing drugs in here? Can I have some or something? I wonder why they had Christian later like play this role. I wonder if he just, if he needed it and asked to or something. I don't know. Yeah, like this whole movie has that vibe, like where it's just like people have like unpaid tax debt or something. something like. Not this movie, I don't think. Maybe, but what's one thing we haven't been keeping track of is what movies Christian Slater's mom did the casting for. Because she's a casting agent and I believe she did it for The Contender. Interesting. Not many of the ones, I've looked it up, not many of the ones we've done were done by her. Sylvester Stallone blocks the bathroom door on the inside with a chair to keep it shut. And I was listening like, does Krishna Slater's house have bathrooms in it with more than one toilet and chairs in them? Because it's like, he, when you see it, it is like, it's like a public bathroom, but it's in yeah. his house. Have you ever seen that? I don't, mm, I don't think so. Like even in a mansion, I don't think I've ever seen bathrooms with more than one toilet in them. I, to be fair, um, I haven't spent a lot of time in mansions. That's all I do. I was just reading about some mansion that has a bathroom with like multiple toilets because the first owners donated the South Milwaukee home to the Girl Scouts around 1920 or 19. 19- oh, whoa. Yes, so they can- have. So that's one mansion that has four toilets and one bathroom. The Girl Scouts of America can do some untoward things with a firefly girl in that multi-toilet bathroom. That seems kind of weird, too. Yeah, a little strange. So Sylvester Stallone, he kidnaps Slater after knocking him out in the bathroom, and they speed away, and they drive him to a boathouse to shake him down. And Stallone saw Jason Momoa at the party, and Slater wakes up in his fox mask in the back seat of the car with Bobo and Quan. He starts causing trouble in the car, doing stuff all drugged out. There's like a little joke where they're like, what could I, he's like, if he wakes up, punch him or something. And then he's like, what's he gonna do? He's wasted. And then of course he like wakes up and starts causing chaos and violence in the car. Do they punch him? Um, I really honestly don't remember how they subdue him. I don't for remember this either. Time. <laughs> but I think it's been a month since I've seen the movie. Let's see. I watched the movie this morning and I don't remember. Like, <laughs> I was going to watch it again. 
but then I just ran out of time. The computer thing I did had to do today with this job, like ended up taking like five out and four hours rather than I thought it was going to take like 20 minutes. Yeah. Anyway, we cut from them and Slater causing trouble in the car to Morel. That's the main bad guy's character name, the Agbage, Agbage guy. His name is Morel. And he's dressing down Jason Momoa for letting Celeste Stallone kidnap Christian Slater. And there's this other guy that explains that the chip in Slater's phone is being tracked. And the bad guy, he wants the kidnappers killed and doesn't care whether or not Christian Slater gets killed in the process of killing them and then he wants the he burns all the evidence file of Greeley from earlier and then we go to the boathouse and Slater's there and he's tied up and he says a racist thing to Taylor Kwan as well where he says don't condescend to me Cato <laughs> I don't I don't remember um I don't remember that part <laughs> it reminded me of true romance where Brad Pitt's like don't condescend to me man those are maybe the only times I've ever heard someone say don't condescend to me so yeah, you really think that, wow, they're just not going to mention the fact that he's Asian and then it just really... It just becomes a big part of things. No one brings up the Jason Momoa's mm-hmm. Pacific islander or something. No one... I don't even remember anyone speaking to Jason Momoa, like, <laughs> Here, I think when the Slater starts giving them information, he does explain Morel. And he also tells them when they're going to torture him, Slater says there's nothing they can do to him that he hasn't done to himself. And then he gives them... He gives up the information anyway. He says Morel is FFFL ex mercenary Central Africa West Lebanese. Stallone takes a shotgun and blows his head up. I was really surprised when his turn came for bullet to the head because I was like, he, yeah, he's just in it like so briefly. Like he's in it so briefly. I was like, why is he in this just to get shot in the head? And he plays kind of like the dweeb. Yeah, I was like, he's kind of the wrong actor for this part. So that makes it even more weird it's like christians later being christians later like turned up to like 11 but you know, it almost seems like the right part for jeremy piven yeah or just i don't know just someone else like it was yeah it's a weird casting to me but it was such a shocking death though in a weird way even though you knew he was gonna die it was kind of jolting with the the blowing his head up with the shotgun which is like, oh, i kind of liked it uh, <laughs> i started to think was this the first movie we saw him die in and then i was like no way we've seen him die in maybe many movies we didn't see him die in Young Guns 2, but we're told he died. He almost becomes undead in Interview with the Vampire. thinking, what are the movies we've seen him die in so far? There was the director or the Tarantino cut of True Romance, he dies, but not in the regular movie. I don't think he's died in any of the ones that I've watched, that we've done a podcast on that I can think of. Because, like, he doesn't even um, die in Interview with the Vampire, right? It just sort of... He dies in Nymphomaniac. Oh, yeah, but not like violently, but he does. He yeah. definitely dies in that one. What was the one before that? The wizard? No, he didn't die. And then, uh,. That it was true romance. We had Interview the Vampire and Pump Up the Volume. No. I didn't watch the movie Dolan's Cadillac, so I don't know. Oh, he know. died in that. That's right. He died in that, too. And then I think um, in the next movie after this, we're going to do will be Slipstream with Arkady Krimlinov, and he will die in that one. He didn't die in Name of the Rose. Yeah, I think it's just, um, didn't die just in Dolan's Cat. What's that? Didn't die in Mobsters. <laughs> no, you're right. He didn't. Or in Hard Rain, or in. Uh, the other one that's not hard rain broken arrow he survived but he died i guess in more than i would have thought yeah me too because my first thought was that it was the first one we saw then i was like oh wait no guys start shooting at them with machine guns in the boathouse and then they somehow escape that and then they blow the place up with booby trapped bombs that stallone has left there just in case and stallone gives the korean guy a detonator as a souvenir of them escaping maybe that was the c4 he stole from the army or didn't steal and then momoa emerges from the water like marlon brando in apocalypse now marlon brando we all know is Jason Momoa's acting idol <laughs> and, and his fitness idol. <laughs> And his daughter is drawing a fish in a bathtub, Baba. And I guess they roll up at her house and the Korean guy uses her computer to find I completely him. forgot about his daughter, like already at this point. That she's gonna she has to fall in love with Taylor Kwan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, at the wedding, are they gonna throw rice or eat it? <laughs> So the 
Korean guy uses the computer at her house and they find money transfers to judges and shit and bribes from Morel. And Kwon calls in info on Morel to New Orleans hom- homicide. Then, like, yeah, this was where, like, the movie just totally just took a dive into boringness. Like, all the energy left it. There's no more nudity and <laughs> there is more violence. Oh, and then we find out that, uh, I guess Baba, her real name is Lisa, and her mother was a hooker junkie who's been dead for 15 years. That's what Stallone tells Quan. Well, and there's also, like, something that we forgot to mention where, like, Quan is, like, psychoanalyzing him or something that's like, oh, you didn't kill that hooker because, like, it reminded you of Oh, that's you right. <laughs> you reminded you of your daughter. Yeah, that was, we should definitely should have brought that up. So Quan then just tries to arrest Stallone for some reason, maybe for killing <laughs> Christian Slater. <laughs> <laughs> Stallone's like, I'll have to put a bullet in your head. And then they decide to not arrest him and just keep going with the plot of the movie. And then we have Morell hanging out with like detectives. They're crooked detectives and stuff that he has on his payroll. And he tells them that when all this is over, he's going to kill Jason Momoa. And they try to talk him out of it. I guess Jason Momoa's character's name is Keegan. And he's Morell's like, he thinks he's a hero, so he needs to die. He's not motivated by money. Now, do you think maybe this was added in later or something when Momoa is getting big? Like, can you figure out any reason why like his character is given more dimension? where he's not just totally a bad guy or something it's very weird yeah like he just for throughout the whole movie he has like no dialogue and he just plays like a big goon or something and it's almost like they couldn't afford to have more of him in the movie because why is he not in this scene if they, and they just talk about him like his character is it's like these are the guys we could afford to have in the movie I don't know <laughs> really weird because yeah like at this point we find out yeah that Jason Momoa just isn't a pure bad guy he has like some kind of soul or something. Then Momoa attacks the tattoo shop and he knocks out the daughter and carries her away. Oh yeah, and there's another reason I thought maybe that was added that he ha- was somewhat of a nice guy because I think in like two scenes, Jason Momoa says he's gonna rape the daughter or something. Yeah, he says something, yeah, to that effect that I also <laughs> Yeah, he's a really good guy. <laughs> so Momoa attacks the guy, he kidnaps the daughter and then Quan goes and meets the homicide chief and this is the beginning of the movie where the guy was going to kill him in the car and Stallone saves him by killing the homicide chief when he puts a gun to Quan's head. And then Jason Momoa calls Sylvester Stallone and has his daughter say hi to him on the phone. And that's where he tells him he wants to rape her. It's like, yeah, you've got a nice daughter here. I'd like to rape her. Morell is at the warehouse, which all these movies need a warehouse. Momoa's there, the daughter's there, and there are just tons of henchmen on multiple levels of uh, catwalks and things. Stallone and Quan uh, show up or though they give him directions they give them directions on the phone to the floor of the warehouse or, or I guess they show up and they tell him what floor of the warehouse where they're supposed to meet Jason Momoa or meet the Morel and Stallone gives Morel this super crazy flash drive of the information to exchange for his daughter do you remember this flash drive it doesn't look like no. any flash drive people use now I seriously like towards like the very end of this movie like I was like oh I need to revisit like the last couple of scenes of this movie because I like got caught up with like some yeah same like work thing like I won't even explain it because it's just boring and stupid but yeah I like got distracted by something like work related and I was like I need to revisit like the last couple of scenes but then I like kind of didn't so that's fair I guess Quan Stallone's making the exchange and he has this wacky old timey flash thumb drive and meanwhile Quan is recording the bad guys with his phone because he's a phone guy and Momoa then kills some bad guy henchmen and bad guys and takes the laptop. Maybe that's that he's going to take the information for his own purposes or something. Quan gets accosted by a henchman who, when he's done recording. Then he kills a henchman and takes his gun. He, he takes off his shirt and so he and Jason Momoa are both in wife beaters. And he throws down the shirt on, and it falls onto the corpse of the henchman who fell. Just weird. And Momoa throws that laptop in some sludge or something. And Stallone hides his daughter from sexy Momoa and then we have more violence and then he detonates his car and pulls another detonator like out of the crotch of his pants and Quan saves the daughter and then Momoa and Stallone have this huge standoff where Jason Momoa finds axes that are dedicated to firemen who saved the building long ago 
Oh, and this is where we find out why he threw away the laptop. Because he now lectures Sylvester Stallone that Morell's plan was to tear the place down after those firemen died saving it. And he's just, so a, he's just, just against he the does. evil He just plan. likes to tear down buildings that have <laughs> social or historical significance. Yeah, he wants to save uh, New Orleans' landmarks. And so then they have a huge fight with these axes. And Stallone finally, like, stabs Momoa in the foot with an axe butt. And then he stabs him in the neck with a knife. And then Quan shoots Momoa in the head, puts a bullet in his head. I kind of think that I remember the rest of the movie from this point forward. I just kind of got distracted through like a couple of scenes, but I, I think I remember this through the ending. In The Expendables, there's a part where Sylvester Stallone, like he and Jason Statham have some kind of like running argument of who's faster, Stallone with a gun or Statham with a knife. They try to kill the same person and they'll like debate who did it first. And in The Expendables, Stallone shoots a dude like 50 times. And then Statham like throws the knife into the same guy. Statham's like, let's call it a tie. And Stallone's like, yeah. Like he like, and it's like not a joke. And in this movie, like Stallone has just stabbed Jason Momoa in the foot and in the neck. And then Quan shoots him. And then Quan's like, I saved your life. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what the hell? No, you didn't. And then Sylvester Stallone shoots Quan. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I definitely remember that. And then, like, Sylvester Stallone's daughter comes to, like, console him and comfort him and stuff. And yeah. Sylvester Stallone's like, you tell them this is the story you're going to tell the cops when they show up or whatever, that, like, I shot you. And do you think he's just shooting him, like, in the same way that he was going to arrest him earlier? Like, he just turned on him or something? But no. But he's doing it because I think he knows that his daughter loves him now. <laughs> yeah, something. it's an excuse to let Stallone get away or something to not have arrested him and then we get more narration like in the beginning from Stallone which is always great when Sylvester Stallone narrates anything any use of just his voice for his voice purposes but he's like Quan didn't wrap me out in his report and six weeks later he sent me a message about maybe having a drink <laughs> and then maybe becomes definitely because they Stallone's at a bar with his bullet bourbon and this is the funniest scene in the whole movie. Yeah, Quan shows up <laughs> and he's late. He gets and Stallone gets mad at him for being late. And then he tells Stallone that he's been seeing a lot of his daughter. <laughs> and he gives him an oral fortune cookie about not coming after him unless he commits more crimes. And he buys him a bullet whiskey. And then he says, then Stallone's like, oh yeah, I bought myself a special ride. In narration, he tells us <laughs> that he bought himself a special ride after he blew up his car. <laughs> and we see him drive it off. That was like the, uh, and I think the car was a Mustang, but I'm not sure. What does he say like when he's like, yeah, if you commit any more crimes? Like, yeah, it's like, I'm not going to arrest you and for then all what the is, crimes. And what does Sylvester Stallone say? Like he says something like, really, like that'll be the day or like something <laughs> real stupid. <laughs> I don't remember, but it was stupid. I can guarantee you that. <laughs> Did you ever watch The Last Boy Scout? Oh my gosh, no, I need to. I like forgot that you told me that. People, ugh, I'm so bad about like watching things when people tell me, like my dad's been telling me to watch Yellowstone for like- Oh gosh, that's what everyone's dad's telling them to watch these years. days. And I keep promising that I'm going to, but- End spoilers. It's just, yeah, it's not terrible in like a, what was the one that like we really hated it, like with the train in the desert? Oh, the, Broken Arrow. Yeah, it's not like hateable in like a Broken Arrow kind of way. Like it's bad, but it's like kind of fun bad. But yeah. not in like a mobsters kind of fun bad. It's just. No, it's, it's kind of just, it's frustrating because it was like really fun bad for a while. Then it went downhill, which brings us to the Slater Raider. What can you give this movie out of a what, scale of one to 10? I guess I would give it like a four. Yeah. I would say a four. I can't really rate it higher than that. I'm going to give it a five. I was going to say five, but then I was like, mm. It's a tough call. You're pretty, I can't blame you for giving it a four. A six would be too much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I didn't hate it, so like... I should give it a five, but like realistically, like it's a four. It's like I liked the first hour and then didn't like the last half hour, but the last half hour is probably the most important part of a movie. Yeah, that's true. So on a scale of one to 10, what do you give Christian Slater's performance? Oh man, I'm going to say like a two. Wow. Wow. You really didn't like him in this one. Yeah, this was like his worst 
almost for me out of the ones that we've watched because I actually like usually he's pretty good it's just like kind of like the movie's bad but he's not bad but like I actually feel like he's bad in this like he's interesting specifically bad I thought he was pretty decent I don't know I felt like he was overqualified for his part but that I thought he was pretty good like I don't know how somebody would be much better with his lines I don't know man you're really making me question I was gonna say they gets a seven or an eight because I feel like he played a very similar role in Dolan Cadillac, except for in that one, he's supposed to be more badass. And I thought he's way better in this. So I'm, yeah, I'm for good. me, he just he just over he just overplayed it. He just it's like he just overdid it. Yeah, he kind of did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. But I'm still gonna give him a seven. What about on hunkiness? Oh, I'm gonna say like a four. <laughs> wow, wow. <laughs> I'm going to give him a five. And then on how much more Slater did this movie need? I mean, I I do think it actually needed like a lot more. Me too. Yeah. So how does this one, like this is the case. Okay, zero thing, is right? no more Slater and 10 is maximum more Slater that it needed. Oh, I would say 10. Okay. I'm also going to go with a 10. Yeah. And that's the end of talk. Well, that's going to be an F for sure. Let's face it. <laughs> And then, uh, so what are you reading these days? Um, I'm reading this book called Behave. That's like about, Behave. Um, like evolutionary biology or something. It's like about why people behave the way they behave because I'm not going to read the whole book. I'm watching these lectures by this guy. He like is like a professor at Stanford because I'm going to this like group discussion about these like lectures in this book, which you could read the book or watch the lectures and I watch the lectures and I'm going to read a little bit the book too. So it's like why people behave the way they do? Yeah, it's like a philosophy discussion about like why people behave the way they behave and there's always like required like reading or viewing or whatever for this group. Do you have any takeaways from it yet? Mm, I don't think I think it's kind of weird that it's like a philosophy group and that this was what they had you watch for like the philosophy group because it's a scientific perspective of why people behave the way that they behave, you know? So it's not really like about philosophy or hmm. anything at all. So I think like the material's kind of weird for what the group is or something. But I mean, it's really interesting. Like the lectures are cool. Like if you look up on YouTube, I think his name's like Robert Sapolsky or something. If you look up like Robert Sapolsky human behavior lectures or something, like his whole like class is on YouTube, his whole Stanford class. It's cool. I mean, it's like interesting. It's a little bit above my like, I'm not super smart about like science and stuff. So it's kind of heady material, but, but it's yeah. good and cool. I've been reading, uh, I just started reading Arturo Perez Reverte's The Sun Over Breda. He's a novelist. He wrote the novel that became the show Queen of the South. Okay. And he also wrote the novel that became the movie The Ninth Gate. Okay, yeah. That's the Johnny Depp Yeah. Movie. I just remember from that movie as a kid, like some woman in like a motorized wheelchair with like her... Yeah, spinning around, around now, dead. Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That book's pretty good. It's called The Club du Mans. The movie's entertaining, but the book was really good. It's what got me into his books. This is part three in a series of books he writes about a fictional old um, Spanish musketeer named Captain Alatriste that gets in adventures. And they actually made a Spanish language movie about it starring Vigo Mortensen that never got released in any form in America. You can watch it for free on YouTube and it's like super high budget for a foreign movie, but they just never even made an attempt to put it out on American DVD that I can find. However, that's not the book I want to talk about. I want to talk about perhaps the greatest book I ever read in my life that I've read since the last time we talked. It's called Advanced Lock Picking Secrets <laughs> by Stephen Hampton. And it's only 42 pages is long <laughs> but it tells you all of it's written in 1988 so it's not quite modern but it contains life-size drawings of how you're supposed to make the picks and not only shows you how to make the picks it tells you how to make them and shows oh, you how wait. and tells you how to like do tumbler locks and like how to make electronic uh, circuit locks to break things. <laughs> wow. And it gives you all of this, it begins with the thing telling you not to use this for illegal means. Have you tried any of the lock picking secrets? No, but I have been talking, take, uh, I have been trying the advice that comes in this final chapter, right at the end, he gives you, well, I guess it's like right before the last three pages. The last thing is that he tells you these secrets he's learned. It's only, I'm gonna read you this, I guess a three page sequence of a 43 page book but he has a chapter after all of this practical information about making lock picks using lock picks all the tools you need he has a chapter called 
energizing your hands. <laughs> it says, I, wouldn't, I would like to introduce an old kung fu method used to strengthen and add flexibility to your fingers and hands. In kung fu, the hands are regarded as terminal points for chi or life force. I don't want to sound mystical, but there is great power of spirit in most schools of kung fu. Your fingers and hands can become clear, open channels for your mind's intentions. I do this exercise to open these channels, and you can do it too. The first part of this exercise is called energizing hands. The hands are energy gateways to and from your body. They allow energy to flow because they are termination points from your heart chakra, or center, where life force resides. In other words, your fingers are the receptors and transmitters of energy. The forearms are the storehouse for this energy, and by stretching your forearms in a certain way, you can induce large amounts of chi energy into your hands and fingertips. First, sit on the floor cross-legged on a thin cushion. Try to get comfortable keeping your back relaxed and straight. Cross-legged is best because the back is straighter and excess energy that might otherwise escape from your feet goes back into your body. Indian style is okay. If you can get the, into a half or full lotus possession, position, that's even better. The main point is to be erect and relax with your eyes open. So anyway, you draw, just to paraphrase this little part, you draw your shoulders, let your arms hang to your sides with your palms flat on the floor, loosen up your arms, try to imagine them being pulled down because of tremendous weight in your hands and you keep them down. And it's like, then you try to lift your hands up off the floor about a half an inch without moving your shoulders up. Your hands should be parallel to the floor, but not touching it. With your hands in this position, you can reap huge amounts of energy from mother earth. Stretch the arms down, make it almost hurt. Stay in this position five to 10 minutes or as long as possible. You will start to shake all over after a few minutes. Don't be concerned. You are collecting power from the earth. The longer you hold this position, the more energy your hands and forearms will accumulate. So he said, then you he have said this at the beginning of the book so that you can get all this like chi heart chakra power in advance of picking the locks well, and this making all these going to enter your heart chakra and the energy is going to stay there until you need to use it for fight or flight situations. And then in parentheses it says, or for picking locks. <laughs> and in fact, you could charge yourself up in this manner whenever you encounter a stressful or otherwise difficult uh, difficult situation. And then it tells you you can locate missing or lost people after you have practiced this for a while by holding your hand left if you are right-handed, right if you are left-handed, up to the general direction of their disappearance. Oh, so he means like literally finding like people like unsolved mysteries. Stuff. Yes. Wow. When I you thought feel... he just meant like friends that you haven't talked no. to. No. <laughs> <laughs> you will be a finder of lost children. When you find a feel a warm buzzing sensation in your fingertips, Tips, chances are they will be in that area. You can also detect intruders in this way. Your hands can be powerful guides when you need them. But where's the line? There's one that there's, he's telling you how to do it with the stretching and stuff. And he says, your palms should be hot right now. They will be charged with chi. If you were to look at them, you would see that they are red with white specks on them. And the white specks are areas of intense energy radiation. A Kirlian photograph made with special equipment would detect this as brilliant lights shooting out from your hands. The hand that you are now looking at can shatter a brick. Practice this exercise five minutes a day for a few weeks and you will definitely notice an improvement in your lock picking abilities. <laughs> Oh my god. It's pretty crazy, huh? That's such a gem. What a find. Yeah, I, <laughs> I found it. I would be delighted at, if I found that. Half-priced books with Boz Gravidson in Austin, Texas years ago. My friend always wants to take me to half-priced books every time I'm there. I was there today because I'm about to go to Texas for a while and I need, I'm like out of books that I can read. Anything, any exciting news or things to report? No, nothing interesting is going on at all. I was thinking about buying like an above-ground pool. Well, Oh, that'd be cool. <laughs> you got to it takes all the upkeep. Work. Yeah. Yeah. That's the one thing that's a bitch. Like, I know a guy that has one, and I swam in it once, and now I always think, like, I'm going to go swimming in his pool. And then he's like, no, you can't, because it's not. It's dirty. All I want to do is just get, like, a floaty thing and just lay on a floaty thing. So I just want to get the pool to, like, lay on a raft in the pool. I just like to drink beers and hold on to the sides of the pool and kick my legs and chill. Maybe I will do it. I don't know. I really need to think about it. But I feel like it costs, like, $500 for all of the things like for the pool and like you need a little vacuum and like you need like i'm a shocked it's that and, cheap yeah yeah i mean it's I not would that think expensive, thousands no because like i feel like you yeah i mean you can get ones that are thousands but i would get like a cheap one like a pretty cheap one one that's just like a few hundred that's cool also i'd like to throw a ball around pool with friends 
Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I was like, if people come visit me, I just want to lay in a raft in the above ground. Yeah, it gets hot there where you are. I got like an ice cream maker. Ooh. Grill. I love ice cream. Yeah, me too. What about you? Anything exciting going on? Nothing. I've been stuck in Oklahoma for months now, waiting to start a job that I finally started doing stuff with. I'm trying to think, I, I did this crazy training class that I had to live in a like apartment that the company had, and we learned things. Oh yeah, this is a job where sometimes like you're gonna work for 12 hours or more, like maybe even close to 24 hours sometimes. And we watched a training video on fatigue, and I could tell that the video had been made by the company because a lot of its advice was like about how to stay up for a long time rather then you shouldn't do this and it was like had information like the average person drinks five to eight cups of coffee a day <laughs> it's like no they don't i do but they don't oh my god if you haven't slept for 24 hours a 20 minute nap is a good idea oh my god well that will be fun yeah 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 the worst part of that video was that like it explained different kinds of jobs and it was like my job's gonna involve a lot of sitting on my ass and it was like this is the kind of job where you could easily fall asleep when you're fatigued and I was like no because it was like the more active jobs is like you probably won't fall asleep doing this but if you're doing this you might yeah the video that my or like the little tv channel that my boss wants me to make he like referred to it as propaganda it was <laughs> he's like oh, oh yours yeah yeah like, yeah it will be propaganda video for them <laughs> it's okay also I had to take a driving class and in the driving class it was cool we got to go out like on an obstacle course and they had a truck that like they could control the it had four wheel drive but they could make either the front or back wheels lock up on you and they just wet this road down and like told you not to try to steer into the skid or anything just to see what happens and like they would make it lock up the back wheels lock up so the car just spins out all crazy like with you in it that was pretty fun and then they have another one where it's like to simulate if you fall asleep on the road and the wheel falls off and then you're supposed to like do what you're not supposed to do. in real life if you fall asleep on the road and your wheel falls off the side of the road you're supposed to just roll to a stop and and then collect yourself and get back on the road they told you just to like whip the wheel and try to get back on and that was pretty fun too because you just whip all like crazy into the other ditch on the other side of the road like it's all it's way more out of control than you would actually think which was pretty fun and then there was another thing where you had to drive at cones and then just dodge them all crazy and then drive at more cones and then dodge those and just keep going back and forth dodging cones. It was, it was pretty fun. Yeah, that sounds fun. Yeah, it was definitely the best part of training. Next episode will be uh, Arkady Kremlinov's sleep stream. 